Hey, Fungo here, and sorry for being a little late to the party, but I think you'll come to enjoy my observations. I think the first thing we all got from this short trailer for the Ashes of Ariandel DLC is the connection to the painted world of Ariamis, especially with the snow and bridge shot. Just like most of you, I too have a take on what the events of the DLC might entail based on the trailer and the handful of concept art and stills. Though I always try to keep speculation to a minimum, I, I can't help but speculate here. What else is there to do? I could be completely wrong on this matter, but y you know, you never know. I might be right. Either way, it should make for a delightful, entertaining, and educational watch, but watch at your own risk. I'm warning you! To start, you can't help but notice the similarities in the names Ariandel from the DLC and Ariamis, who created the painted world in Dark Souls 1. The origin of the name Ariandel could really be anything. For one, you know when you kill someone you collect their ashes? What if the ashes of Ariandel are the ashes of a person named Ariandel, dead or alive? While Ariandel could be a painting or a real location, I'm leaning more towards Ariandel being a person. That's right, and her painting would be called The Painted World of Ariandel, which is, sadly, in ashes. The DLC could take place in a dream, within the snowy terrain of Skyrim, or we could even visit the real place that inspired Ariamis' or even Ariandel's painting. I believe it'll all take place within the tattered and destroyed remnant of a painting. Ariamis from Dark Souls 1 is never mentioned in Dark Souls lore and is considered a big fat mystery. The only reason we know Ariamis is even a person at all is because of this line of dialogue. Why could thou not let us be? Didst thou not see why Ariamis created this world? And that's it! That's all we know! I feel this expansion will divulge more information on who he or she is. From what it seems, you encounter a mysterious non-player character doing a prostration gesture at the Cathedral of the Deep Bonfire. Judging by the closed shortcut doors, this may be an encounter through natural progression to this area. Upon encountering him, a cutscene plays out in which he gives you what appears to be a cloth or scrap. I have a very good feeling this is a remnant of the original Ariamis painting. This old, bearded character could very well be Ariamis, but I won't rule out the possibility he's some new, unspoken of character. Knowing Dark Souls, his identity will likely remain ambiguous. Judging by his appearance, mannerisms, and the way he is found upon encountering him, I cannot help but notice there's something very dire, something personally affecting him, and he needs an unkindled warrior's help. Two possibilities. You either touch the torn painting he hands you, then you are whisked away to the new area of the DLC, or you take this as an item and burn it at the shrine bonfire as you would an undead bone shard. But I'm leaning more towards the former possibility. If From Software went all out, there is a chance possibility Yorshka may have some extra dialogue regarding the new area, what you accomplish in that area, or, if you are given an item, something about that or how to use it. She's connected in some way to Priscilla, who lived in the painted world of Ariamis, so it makes sense. She needs more dialogue as it is, there's just not enough dialogue for Yorshka. Don't you agree? I think everyone here agrees. Upon listening to the cowering mystery man's dialogue, when he hands you this key item, I'll repeat his words for time, he says, Unkindled one, if you are like us, another forlorn soul, with no place to call your own, then show my lady flame. At that point, we see a small lady with incredibly long hair, on a stepladder, raising her hands to an incomplete painting, as if feeling for warmth as one would do to warm their hands at a bonfire, feeling for the flame that does not yet exist. Ashes and flame is the central theme of Dark Souls 3 in general, but it seems to play a larger role in this expansion. You see a few times in the trailer, something that of a monstrosity, possibly being the end boss of the DLC, and there's a lot of speculation revolving around her. Who could she be? Well, she could be some unknown character, but uh, I'm fairly positive this is more than likely the goddess of sin and punishment, Velka. All of this, judging from her crow feathers, thick black hair, and even a cauldron. Her witch-like attributes fits very well with what we know of Velka in the first game. Velka was always referenced as such in Souls lore and has slight connections to the painted world of Ariamis. Upon encountering her, it seems there is a cutscene where you witness her staked to the ground and tied up to a chair, self-flagellating herself. Um, I don't know if that's true. I mean, flagellating. Self-flagellation is a religious act of punishment for one's own sins that is still in use today in some countries. And in religion, 
such as monasticism or some Catholic branches such as the Opus Dei. <laughs> I did my research. Could it be, judging by her deformed, transformed nature and self-punishment, that she lost her way because of greed? Harnessing and possessing the flame within her cauldron? The flame that Ariandel is destitute of? Considering Velka is the goddess of sin and back in the day had servants to mete out the proper punishment, if she was indeed restrained, turned against what she stood for out of greed and even gluttony, judging from her face being buried in the bowl of flame soup concoction, that could very well explain the lack of followers she has today and why she was so absent in the lore of the game. Besides, of course, you know, being a statue of her former self. Even her memory was lost, preceding the events of Dark Souls 2. Velka is deeply associated with ravens, or crows, they are pretty similar. There are ravens and crow-human hybrids everywhere that will also make an appearance in the expansion as age-deformed creatures. Judging by the way they are transformed, it seems almost like they carry a burden. And that burden is of several stillbirths. Oh god, ugh. You know, I Considering they are crossbreeds, uh, perhaps they are unable to reproduce and this is the product of that. Oh god. Uh, but their aged physique gives me a pretty good idea this area takes place in present day. While I like the theory that this boss is Velka and that she did this to herself to punish herself for her sins of glutton and greed, going against her nature by stealing the fire away, but there's also the possibility she was restrained against her will, pulling from the lore of Prometheus in Greek mythology. Prometheus was chained to a rock against his will as an eagle ate upon his liver as his punishment. Each and every day his liver would grow back and the eagle would return to continue his punishment. Why was he being punished? It had everything to do with fire. Think back to the line from the trailer. Then show my lady flame. Story has it he gave the human race the gift of fire, but in a fit of rage, Zeus, the major inspiration for Gwyn, stole the fire back. Prometheus yet again resupplied the human race with fire, an action for which he was punished by Zeus. It certainly sounds like Miyazaki did indeed take inspiration from this mythology regarding flame, but with a darker twist. While flame doesn't appear to be absent in the world of the area we visit in the DLC, a certain kind of flame is. It's not like it grows on trees. Oh, well, it does. And perhaps it has something to do with the profaned flame. Even Junji Ito, my absolute favorite horror manga writer ever, has dealt with similar themes. Taking inspiration from the story of Prometheus in a new light with his story titled Blackbird. It's a story of a man who was injured while hiking and was unable to move, pretty much left for dead. Just as he was beginning to starve, a shadowy bird-like figure visited him and fed him meat as a mother bird would do for its young. When he was starting to die of thirst, she would return to feed him blood. He was found a month later surprisingly healthy and nursed back to a full recovery. He was grateful for the mysterious being for saving him, but it wouldn't stop visiting him and so he left Tokyo in hopes to get rid of her. Regardless of where he went, it followed him and started becoming more and more aggressive, eventually starting to bite off pieces of his flesh. Later, through testing, it was discovered through DNA the flesh and blood was his and seemingly from the future. His skeleton was later found along with a diary of the events that led to his demise. I'll read this directly from the page. They say that when he was found, a huge black bird was pecking at the corpse. <laughs> Disturbing stuff, huh? The story is seemingly a new twist on Prometheus, just like how Velka's situation seems. You know, Dark Souls 3 does have a history of spiritual connections such as the possibility of the dead old wolf being Sif. The Abyss Watchers being corrupted by the Abyss similar to Artorius. Yorshka, who bears many similar traits to Priscilla, sitting in a tower where the painted world used to be. And the obvious connections to Osiris and Seath. We can see in the trailer how the whole boss fight will play out. I'm assuming about halfway through this battle you'll encounter a cutscene where the fire from her cauldron, the same fire she dumps on your ass, burns down the area surrounding the battle arena. I'm also assuming she breaks free of her constraints and that's when the fight gets real. Also, right here you can see her one barely visible eye is glowing brightly. It's obfuscated through the flame she's pouring on you. Coincidentally, there are enemies in the game also associated with flame and they too have bright and glowing eyes. The Jailers and Handmaidens. Lore has it that the Handmaidens caused the profaned flame epidemic through a curse. The axe called Eleonora actually has a description that might be of interest. The profaned flame was triggered by the curse of the Handmaidens 
maidens, relatives of a certain oracle. But despite their culpability, they went on living, without any cares. While some are pretty firm in the theory that the oracle referenced here is Alsana from Dark Souls 2's DLC, at least that was my theory, the real oracle referenced in that item description could very well be this monstrosity you fight. If she is not Velka, what if she is that certain oracle? possibly named Eleonora. It's extremely hard to choose between the two, but if I had to choose based on the evidence, I would say that it's probably Velka. Like I said earlier though, it'll be ambiguous and her name will be something like the Profaned Goddess or the Profaned Oracle. It'll be similar to how they introduced the Nameless King. I know what you must be thinking. You must be thinking, but Fungo, Fungo, oh, Fungo, the profaned flame incinerates not but human flesh. So if she is harboring profaned flame, then why is she able to burn down the infrastructure of the building with it? It's not human flesh and it burns not but human flesh. The answer to that one, I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see if any of this speculation even pans out. Now we should take into account the constant wolves we see. They seem to be a common enemy, but there is one large wolf that howls. Judging from the size of the tree surrounding it, it's quite obvious it's not an ordinary sized wolf, and it, it looks a bit like Sif. Perhaps this big wolf is in some way related to Sif? Or a spiritual successor? There's really no way to tell, as Sif has no connection at all to this specific area, yet. Now let's take a look at Norse mythology and Odin. Odin had two wolf war companions by the name of Gedi and Freki that were always at his side. But also, maybe not so coincidentally, Odin also had two raven companions by the names of Hugin and Mugen, in which they were taught to speak and retrieve information for him. Then there was also the wolf known as Fenrir, a son of Loki, who was a very large, oversized wolf, tasked with killing Odin, but failed in the end. I cannot help but see many influences to Norse and definitely some Greek mythology, especially with the Norse Viking-clad axe-wielding enemy that may be a mini-boss of sorts. His attacks are powerful, especially his mini earthquake attack, but there's no doubt in my mind where his design and inspirations were derived from. There are also a few enemies or creatures you get glimpses of, including the so-called Forlorn Souls, wandering in the distance of this shot. In these shots, you see trees that move with little flames in place of leaves. Looking closer at the screenshots, you can tell they are personified with a human form and wispy black hair waving in the wind, perhaps being witches of the past. I'm sure they are not aggressive and likely won't attack you, but I, I wouldn't risk taking my advice so soon. This is not too dissimilar to the Great Wood Plague of the Undead, seen growing from stalks of trees throughout the rest of the game. As you have seen time and time again, corpses and trees have somehow merged. Okay, now back to the scenic shot of the bridge. This is quite obviously a variation of the bridge leading to the painted world. As you can see, it's not nearly as dilapidated and everything seems to have seen better days. In fact, while it will retain some nostalgia, the design is completely different and I'm sure that will go for the majority of the expansion. My take on this is that because the original painted world was a parallel world made to imprison abominations, that world's upkeep wasn't very pristine. I'm sure both places will look the same in areas, but will be vastly different because of the reinterpretation of Ariamis' original painting. Or, for the other theory, the inability to capture every little nuance of the real location. Further solidifying either theory is not only because of the bridge and snow, but because of this picture here. If I'm not mistaken, this really appears to be the area in the painted world that's filled with bone wheel enemies. If you look very closely at that round crank, there's no mistaking that's the same round crank as found in that area. Because this crank is not found anywhere else in Dark Souls 3, this makes for very good circumstantial evidence that we'll be visiting a lot of familiar areas along with some new. These bug-like enemies now inhabiting the area cannot possibly be any worse than the ninja bone wheel enemies that stun lock you to death. Towards the end of the trailer, you hear a slightly different tone to the narrator. The ashes have come at last. <laughs> I have no doubt this is a dialogue from after completing the DLC. While it sounds pretty damn devious, especially coupled with that laugh, it could just be his way of praising your completion of the quest. We do see some sneak peeks of new characters, and I'll delve into them more. 
Now I can't say I know what kind of story the prostrating guy plays, other than being the guy that gives you the item to access the DLC, but in my opinion he stays where you met him and you can go back to him after completing the DLC for more dialogue and rewards. He could very well be Ariamis, judging from his age and his involvement in the matter. On the other hand, this girl, in my opinion, could very well be the daughter of Ariamis, trying to take over for her father and recreating his painting, maybe? Well, that's my theory. Or maybe she's some savant, trying to create something fresh and original and new. I know that sounds like a joke, but it might be true. But she lacks the flame to do so. Not sure how that makes sense, but I'm sure it will in time. Then there's the hooded girl sitting on a chair. She's very mysterious. She could be a completely new character, perhaps even a firekeeper, judging from her attire. I, I don't really know. Maybe you can convince her to head to the shrine. Mm, uh, maybe she's Velka. Maybe she's Alsana, the silent oracle, the, the one I mentioned earlier. Sh she could also be part of the royal bloodline. Oh yes! And then there's the royal bloodline. Now with the royal bloodline in mind, take a look at the blood leading its way to the cauldron the boss uses in battle. Then the scene of the boss using it to bash your brains in as if gaining some sort of strength or power from this blood. Now this may sound really out the wall, but could it be blood pouring from your soul's sins for murdering the royal bloodline? I can assume the following scenes immediately afterwards have some significance to that. I'm positive it's not just filler, but instead, a hint. All the battles they are showing here aren't showing off any new gear or armor whatsoever, so what other reason other than filler are we seeing boss battles we've already seen in the main game? Perhaps it's because they are all of the same royal bloodline. Osiris is the king of Lothric. Nameless King is the exiled son of Lord Gwyn. The twin princes are the crippled children of the king and queen of Lothric. And Aldrich has consumed and transformed into Gwendolyn, the eldest son of Gwyn. I should also point out, they don't show any bosses that aren't of the royal bloodline, which makes it very suspicious. I saved this for last because, well, it's a big fat what if and a major stretch. But what if there's some influence not only from the painted world of Ariamis, but also from Aleum Lois? A combination of the two in some direct or indirect way? Remember that axe weapon from earlier? It's called a Leonora, which is very close to Aleum and even alludes to an oracle. Most likely, Alsana, who stayed there in Aleum. That oracle was trying to control a raging fire that could not be extinguished, a fire not too dissimilar to the profaned flame. She also harnessed the ability to create ice, snow, and frost, which could also explain why there is a new addition of frost magic in the game. Eleonora, Eliam, Ariandel, Ariamis, the uncontrollable fire, the frost and snow, the bridge, the crank, the hybrids, it all just comes together perfectly. It'll tie together the mystery of the profane flame and also divulge more information on a mysterious character from the second game. Now, after all that and taking a look back, if you were to ask me who that hooded mystery lady was, I'd say she's Alsana. Oh, and you're probably thinking, geez, doesn't he think Priscilla will make an appearance? I want to hear his opinion on that. Well, my answer to that is no. I'm sure we'll find some information on Priscilla and what happened to her and or her whereabouts because it, it hurts not knowing. But I personally know Miyazaki. Actually, I don't, but knowing him, you'll end up finding her doll and the description will be like, Priscilla died a sad, lonely death, never knowing love with no one to carry on her memory or legacy. She lived as an abomination and died as one, not fit for this world. Ashes of Arianda will hit on October 25th, and I'll be making a guide and a lore video on it soon afterwards. Here's something I thought would be fun. A list of all my predictions. Let's see how right or wrong I was when the DLC comes out. If you have any other predictions, thoughts, or something else to contribute, be sure to let me know in the comments. Be a YouTube hero. Please don't vlog this video. I worked really hard on it. A big thanks to my new patrons, Tyler Hunter and Sergeant Baker. These following patrons are amazing, and they deserve a special shout out. The legendary Chris and Sandre Friesvold. Tyler Hunter, my one and only hero, the elite Felipe Russo, Apothecary 2, and Alex Loop. Also, take a look at my last Souls Lore video, which I'm very proud of. It took a lot of time. Now, if you've seen this video and don't want to watch it again, then why not vote for which video you'd like to see next? Simply click which video interests you most. I'll tally up the votes afterwards, and that's the one I'll work on and put out first.
By the way, after making this video I found the spoiler-ridden Japanese gameplay trailer of the DLC, and it's quite unfortunate because it gives you a lot more info on who this mysterious character is, and uh, a lot of other stuff could have been added to this video. It just sucks it came out right after making this video, so it just sucks I couldn't get it out quicker. It just sucks. One more thing. I hate this. This looks horrendous. Big capital letters on my screen that say PURCHASE ADDONS. You don't think we already know. I already own all the add-ons. Couldn't you have made it more subtle? Are we stuck with this on the title screen forever now? I don't spend a whole lot of time on the title screen, so maybe it's nitpicking, but gah! Well, thanks for watching, and you'll see some more from me very soon.